tune in, tone up. Your one-stop shop for guitar, tricks, tips, techniques and advice. With me, Gary Shilladay, and my own excellent teacher, Dan Davis. In Guitar Lesson 31, Dan reminds me about some of the approaches you can use when embellishing chords, including the use of double stops and different intervallic sounds. You will hear Hendrixisms, discussion on how to connect major scales, chords and intervals, and some interesting approaches to help make your rhythm play more interesting. Finally, we'll look at the different flavours created by a variety of intervals. wondering today about whether we could look at double stops and bends in a, yeah across well, a couple of genres maybe or yeah we've sort of done the country thing before i don't think we've done it to death but we did do a session on the country stuff so we would definitely be crossing over probably some of the things we've done before maybe with that but but we can look at the double stop thing i think it's something which eludes maybe quite a few players and the thinking two places of the guitar at once maybe or yeah Yeah, I will relay a story to you, which is how I know that this is the case. When I was about 19, 20, I went on this music course at Canterbury University. Basically, the bass player, Herbie Flowers, had rented out Canterbury University or asked him if he could use the whole campus and their dorms or something. So a load of us kids could descend on the place and create merry musical hell. And I, it was the first time that I met guitar ace Big Jim Sullivan. And one of the things I had to ask him as a question was about these pesky double stops. Now, at the time, I could play pretty fast. I knew a whole bunch of scales and knew a whole bunch of modes. I was no slouch. I had a pretty vicious pick attack. Uh, I knew a whole bunch of chords and all the rest of it. But these double stops, they just kind of eluded me. And I think it was possibly for me a slight disconnect between the chords and the scales. Because, of course, we can easily put scales in one camp. That's our lead playing. That's that camp right there. They're running up and down the pentatonic. Yeah, whatever scale you may know, you know, the new scale, run up and down that, I guess. Yeah. And then you get your chords. Now, both, in terms of how they're often taught, fall into very similar camps. Both are taught in quite a pictorial way. So when you learn chords, here's a chord box. This is how it works. At the side is the fret you play it at. And you go and you play the shape. There you go, you've got the chord. Wonderful. Great. Yeah. Now with scales, it's the same. You know, we've got that little kind of maybe elongated chord box and we put in there where maybe the fingers go and we learn a pattern or even if you write it down in tab, people soon, you know, with with even a grain of intelligence realise that that there's a pattern there. So if you're playing the E major scale... At the 12th fret, and you're doing it three notes per string, you're probably going to go 12, 14, 16 on the bottom two, and then 13, 14, 16 on the next two, and then 14, 16, 17 on the final two, which is going to give you just over two octaves. Yep. So it's a fairly simple pattern. It's fairly regimented. Once you learn that to a point, you're good to go. But do you understand from those two things how the two link together? No. No. Not a hope in hell. What chords are in the key? I don't know. I just know a bunch of chords. Well, that doesn't really help us either. Knowing the scale won't do you any good unless from the scale you can use it as some kind of springboard to create a formula to generate the chords. Yeah. So when we talk... And you can see the chords overlap or overlaid, can't you, into the... 
patterns, but it takes a while to get there, I think. You can, so. but you'd need to know maybe a, at least two or three patterns to to kind of get them all. Yeah, yeah. You know, and if you didn't know what you're looking for, well... Mm, yeah, exactly. You know, you're lost. Exactly. So to get to the, the point of the matter is when we're dealing with double stops, essentially we're dealing with something that falls somewhere between a single note and a full chord. Yep. You know, okay, you've got two notes together. Sometimes we play power chords like that, you know. Root and the fifth. Yeah. But more often than not, we add another note in above it. But with the the sort of double stops we're talking, we're talking sort of countryside of things and keeping it, keeping it proddy. But it's all very chord based. We're really picking specific notes from chords. So even if you had all of the notes in the scale, you would have to have probably a better knowledge of the fretboard to pick all of the notes in the right place as you go down the board. Yeah. And you need a knowledge of the chords to pick out the appropriate ones for the chords that you're trying to outline. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Yeah, you're not going to want to play every note, are you? Because that's not how chords are formed. They're formed off every other note, pretty much, usually, with a bit of an extension up the top as well. First, third, fifth, and seventh. Yeah, I mean, you can add that stuff as well. You can add other notes from the scale, mm. even bits of melody in using using sort of double stops. They can be very, very useful for a number of reasons. I mean, even if you think of octaves, essentially an octave is yeah, okay. Some people will go, that's oh, octaves, sort of double stops. Okay, technically you're right. But it's still two notes played simultaneously. Mm. And it, it still does a similar job. It's where chords are too much and single notes are not enough. Yeah. And the great thing with, with double stops where we're, we're picking specific notes from the chords is we've got a much more melodic kind of basis that we're working with. Yeah. So what we're going to do, we're going to look at maybe chords in a key. Okay. Do you know all the chords in a major key? You probably do. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So don't need to go through that for your benefit, but for the benefit of our listeners, grab a piece of A4 paper and a biro. Yep. Good. (laughs) Now you've got your piece of A4 paper and a biro. Write this down. Your chords in a major key, there are seven, because there are seven notes plus the octave note. Well, the octave note is the same as the first, but an octave up. So we don't need to repeat ourselves. So in any major key, the chords go as follows. It's a major chord, minor chord, minor chord, major chord, major chord, minor chord, diminished. So once again, major, minor, minor. Major, major, minor, diminished. So using the good old-fashioned C scale, yep. C major, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, we would end up with C major, D minor, E minor, F major, G major, A minor, B diminished. And we return to the C again. So it goes in like a cycle. So knowing that, will help you. Yeah. Now, the other thing to do, because I know there's probably loads of guitarists out there who play in minor keys, and we are going to look at this in different styles, so although we'll look at the pretty country versions, we'll look at some minor things as well. Every major has a relative minor. The relative minor is three frets lower than the major. So for C major, A minor is its relative minor. It contains the same notes in the scale. The only difference is we're starting on A and finishing on A, but we're still having all the white notes on the piano. Instead of going C, D, E, F, G, A, B, we're going A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So the notes essentially are the same. You've got to remember the notes 
with the scale, they kind of go in a cycle, you know. They don't change from octave to octave. They just kind of continue and regenerate, yeah. you know. So also, because you're pulling from the same set of notes, you're pulling the same set of chords. So you'll C major, D minor, E minor, F major, G major, A minor, and B diminished. It's all going to fit still. It is. Now, if you want them in the order, have you got your biro? I told you to go and get it. Right. (laughs) And your piece of paper. Come on. (laughs) So in a minor key, it's this. Minor. Diminished. Oh, sorry. Major. Minor. Minor. Major. Major. And we're back to the beginning. So those in the major and minor keys form our our basic chord selection because our double stops are going to be built on those chords. Yep. It's as simple as that. Got to see those chords within the double stops. Yep. That's that's right. I mean the easiest way to start I think is let's let's pick a chord progression. I want you to you to pick a maybe an easy four chord chord progression. In A minor or C? Does up, it... up to you. Okay, so we'll go A minor then because I'm a little less used to not working in the minor key. Uh so we're gonna go A minor, D minor, F, C. Okay, that's good. A minor, D minor, F and C. When we want to translate these double stops onto a guitar, the easiest way to do it is to build it into your chord. Now, you don't have to build it into your chord. I'm talking about the easiest way to get started with it. Okay. It's the one thing that foxed me when I was younger because of this disconnect. And I'm sure I'm not the first guitar teacher to have said it. Yeah. And I'm sure I'm not the first guitarist to have had that disconnect. I even remember a Guthrie interview where he said exactly the same. He had these lead and rhythm parts and they lived in two completely opposite opposing camps. Uh, Never the twain shall meet. Yeah, I've read a thing about him. I think he says it in the start of his creative guitar book as well, doesn't he? He talks about rhythm and lead playing, I think. In, quite in quite possibly. That's a very, very good book. Go and buy it, folks. Creative Guitar, books one and two. Yeah, so connecting the two together, this, this, is, this is the golden nugget. If you can connect your scales and your chords together, it's the real way to unlock the fingerboard, I think. Yeah, that makes sense to me as well. It, yeah, it, it really, really does. Because you see all of the chord progressions in tunes as they are for the keys that they're in. So when something does throw you a curveball, you don't go, oh, that's just a chord in the tune, isn't it? You, know, you go like, ah, oh, right, okay, all oh, that's in there. That's yeah. interesting. All right, I see what's happened here. You smell a rat in the camp. And for me, those nights where things are going well and it seems like the guitar is working with me rather than against me they're, they're very a, infrequent but it's a cruel mistress <laughs> i can tell you i would say that those nights where it seems to be going better are nights where i can see that better because mm. i don't always see that very well so I, I, it definitely makes sense what you're saying is what yeah is what i'm I, saying I, as well really if you ever feel rubbish about your own playing I, the amount of times i've had a tussle with my tone or i can't get the sound i want or You've gone for something you really, really shouldn't have, and it's all ended in carnage. You know, it gets better as your as your technique improves and your confidence goes up. And if you're playing live and you're playing the same songs with the same band for long enough, that helps because you kind of end up with almost sort of set parts rather than this one solo which you've never played before in front of an audience. We still have our good and bad moments. Yes, yeah. You know, when it's good, it's very, very good. When it's bad, it's awful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we're going to build these into chords. I'm, I'm going to show you a few few examples. I'm going to use your, your chord example as a springboard to show the folks at home what we can do. Now, there's several places we can play these chords. So we've got A minor. On the fifth fret there. D minor. F, C. So we've done our A minor as a bar chord at the 5th fret. Same with D minor, bar chord at the 5th fret. F, major shape at the 8th eighth fret. C, major shape at the 3rd fret. Now the minor is very easy. Yeah. 
So for that sort of thing, we can literally on the G, D, A, and E. So all four strings, yeah. Yeah. The B would be a bit of a rogue because you'd be hitting an F sharp, yeah. which falls outside of the key. That'd be fine if you were playing a blues. You could also use the top string. Now I'm just going to concentrate really on the G, D, and B, uh, G, D, and A strings. I won't worry too much about that B bottom yeah. string, but just there. So just literally there. barring at the fifth and working the seventh fret, flicking the finger on and off each of those strings. Okay. Oh yeah. All right. So you could use yeah. the fret and the bottom like the you know, yeah. the C note before you go down okay yeah 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 so, so it's quite simple really now if you really wanted to be a bit of a blackguard you could take that shape up to the 10th instead of crossing over to the D minor at the 5th yeah and use your D minor at the 10th The other, yeah. What was the other pattern you was in? So we're going, got this one. It's literally any connection. Is now, when you get to the D minor, because B is in yeah. your key, the 12th fret B, 10th fret barred with your first finger, you could actually. Use that happen. Yeah. So we can literally go all the way down, can't we, like that? Yeah. Absolutely. Now if you if you've got a piece where maybe it's moving pretty fast yep. from chord to chord, using an approach where you're playing a not dissimilar line but using the same shape and moving the shape around is a very good way of sort of using your muscle memory but still working with the with the change of chords. Yeah. Still kind of keeping the guitar line consistent. If you want to move up to the D minor at the fifth fret <laughs> Still, you can hammer on that second finger on the sixth fret of the B and have it against the the barred fifth fret top E, seventh fret on the G, and then seventh fret on the D. Chord, yeah. chord shape wise 
both offer fairly accessible ways to play double stops. Yeah. And we're starting to see how the notes in the key maybe connect. If you kind of reverse engineer all this stuff, you'll realize that it's all natural notes because we're in the key of C. Yep. Now, when we go for the major ones, the major chords are very well connected to the minor chords. So we go up to the F here. Now, we've done this one before, I know. Yeah. So we're going to we're gonna fret the F at the 8th fret, normal major shape, sometimes referred to as the A shape. I'm going to play it cheekily with my finger just on the 8th yeah. fret of the A. I'm up, not going to faff around with barring it because I'm not going to hit the top E string. And then my third finger is going to cover D, G, and B. Yep. Throw all your guitar books away. No, maybe not that rash, but, <laughs> you know, all these books that say, oh, you have to put three fingers there to cover the three strings. Well, have you seen the size of my fingers? <laughs> yeah, it's not going to work, that. folks. I've never done that, really. So, we've got the F shape. And then we take that third finger that's lying across those three strings, D, G, and B, yeah, and fret. we slide it from the 10 to the 12th. 10 on the A string. And then you've got your first finger replacing the third finger. Yeah. And then all of the stuff you've just done for D minor still works you're in the same position, aren't yeah. you? So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the last one is C. Yep. So the same deal is the A shape played at the third fret, the normal major three, five, and five. Yep. Middle four strings, same deal. Now, again, because of the way the scale works, the only rogue really is the B string, where we have to play the F rather than the F sharp. So we've got this kind of... those patterns actually getting those patterns under your fingers and into your into your mind a little bit it can really just embellish those chords really well can't it yeah i mean when i when i went to that canterbury university and I've, i asked big jim sullivan about these these double stops you know yeah and he said what is it of these double stops that you ask and i was like well, how 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 does it all work and he showed me a few cool double stops and I sort of started to realise how really what makes them work is they're connected to the chords. It's like playing a little bit of a chord. Because you're often playing kind of two notes at once for a double stop. Yeah. Like, like this kind of thing is considered a double stop as well, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> see the chords within that as as I go down now it's without a, fail you know the difficulty is that, that, that yeah you're right you, you can see the chords in that it's quite easy in it G major you've got G major F E minor D minor yeah E minor or C yeah that's actually D minor it looks major it looks like B flat it's not yeah A minor yeah yeah but when they're in a kind of a straight down position riding on the back of a bar chord it's a bit harder to fathom yeah but essentially like our C there we just change from a C with C in the bass to a C with E in the bass yes yeah. so if I hammer this string on the on the B at the 6th fret if I put that note in I've now got a C sus 4 yeah sounding and then take it off you've got the C if I put down the 7th fret on the G against the B I've now got a sus 
Nine. Right. Yeah. And add nine. Yeah. And add nine. That's all right. I think about that. Could be a sus two, I suppose, couldn't it? But it's not really. But... Oh, no, it is a sus two, isn't it? Add nine or sus two. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. My brain's failed this week with illness. And there, you've either got an A minor on the next string where you add the seventh fret on the D, or you can look at it as C add nine. And then we're back to C with E in the bass. Yeah. See what I mean? Essentially, they are related to chords. Uh, and Jim Sullivan was, we were talking last time, and you were telling me about how he was, you know, the, the style magnate, I would say, um, really into playing lots of different styles like Carl Perkins and a few others we mentioned. It was his job. Yeah. I think he told me that something like after nine months of playing, he was working. I can kind of, if you're an obsessive young man, yeah, yeah, and you've got all the time every day. Yeah. You look at um, who is it? The man in black. Oh dear, Johnny Cash. Johnny Cash. Yeah, you look like you're going to a funeral. I mean, yeah, <laughs> my own. <laughs> yeah, bless him. I mean, he was He's amazing, amazing performer, an yeah. incredible songwriter, but he didn't start out like that, right? He was really basic, wasn't he? He didn't start out really particularly a guitar player. He was on his voice. Yeah, Yeah, more than anything. Fledgling guitar player, you know, sort of struggling to string together a couple of chords. He was always quite good rhythmically, wasn't he? When you hear his rhythms and stuff, there's something that he get. He'd be quite groovy. I think by the time he hit the live circuit, right? he, he kind of seemed to have nailed it down. But, I mean, in the early... In the early years, you know, his, his sort of first marriage failed due to his sort of trying to keep his work life and his family life together and going at the same time, wasn't it? Yeah. And yeah. I think that was one of the bugbears that his wife had. Yeah. So when you asked Big Jim Sullivan about the double stops and stuff, those type of double stops, did he talk about what style? Was it a Hendrix? I mean, it sounds very Hendrixy, but was there someone else that was doing them earlier or...? Do you know what? I I think I must have had really strange guitar teachers. <laughs> right. When I think about how much paper I go through when I write stuff out for people, I tended to, to end up being taught by people who kind of went, here you go, here's as much information as you need. Yeah. I think you're good enough to work out the rest. Yeah. Off you go. And that's how it went. So it was almost like a given that you take this information and you make it work. And didn't necessarily talk about styles. I suppose I was thinking at the time Hendrix. Yeah. Because, of course, you've got Little Wing, Axis, Boulders, Love. That double stop style was all over a lot of his things. And people even refer to it as sort of like Hendrixy style playing. But, I mean, the people that have come after, many people have used it. Richie Cotson's used that style of playing many, many times. Yeah. John Frusciante from the Chili Peppers, Red Hot Chili Peppers has used that style of playing many, many times. I think probably most famous guitar players have. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. You know, be, yeah. be them Stevie Ray Vaughan or whoever, you know, have, have used that particular style because it's just such a nice way to embellish chords. In terms of who was doing things before, I think... Hey, that, that guy in the band, Robbie Robertson. Oh, Robbie Robertson. Robbie Robertson is a good player. Do was he not post Hendrix? Um, thinking of the band, I would have thought possibly, yeah. I mean, Hendrix, I guess so. Hendrix was quite late at the game, sort of 66, 67. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I'd have I to mean, look that up, actually. I mean, the Beatles never really did anything like that. The Stones never really did anything with that kind of styling. I think it was probably very much a, a Jimi Hendrix thing. I think some of that sort of nice stuff that Jimi yeah. Hendrix played was possibly born out of some of the session work he'd done. Because when you work for other people, when you work for vocalists and big bands and you've got to kind of not tread on the vocals all the time, you know, it's very much the case that that maybe playing full chords is just going to be too much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also probably it was fueled by having to make a three-piece work because, you know, if you strum through chords and then solo, it's... And the distortion maybe as well. I mean, he's got... You know, he was he was going for a bit of a distorted type sound, and he's quite new to that. And you can't uh, play too many notes at once with a, it gets a bit mucky, maybe. Yeah, I mean, some, sometimes his sound got his sound got pretty raucous because I mean, the Marshalls back then didn't have a master volume. Mm. 
they didn't have a gain circuit. You just turned them up. <laughs> and the, the cabinets, cabinets were not designed to handle 300 watts like a modern 4x12. They were designed to handle 100 watts. Right. So if you got a Marshall, Marshall at one point, believe it or not, this is crazy stuff, really. Although they were renowned for being unreliable, Marshall in the 60s, when people were relying on their back line to generate the volume so the audience could hear them, at one point Marshall brought out a 200-watt head called the Marshall Major. Goodness me. So wow. you would have to put it <laughs> through two 4x12 cabinets just for it to handle the volume. Sounds like some of those, sounds some like, of the nuclear arms like race. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> Goodness me. Ouch. No, a mate of mine had like a 180 watt diesel head. Oh, right. Okay. And I was like... That was loud. <laughs> and I was like, John, it's 180 watts. You play in your bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> Do the odd gig. <laughs> Yeah, it's brilliant, brilliant. But, you know, back then it was all about, you know, wiring a load of heads and cabs up because that's your backline, that's your sound. No one's going to mic you up, mate. Wall of amps type of thing. Amps. Yeah, that's the way forward. Yeah. For that, all kind of- so a lot of it was power amp distortion. Yeah. So not particularly gainy, but very, very fat. I think he used to use a fuzz face to kind of sort of push it over the edge and, yeah. and give it more of a kick. He had the wire bar pedal as well, didn't he, I suppose? But mainly using strats, you had quite a bit lower but and less mids than you would with a humbucker. Yeah. So you you retained a fair amount of clarity in everything you did in terms of changing your sound, unless you're going to press a pedal, you did from the guitar. Yeah. You had no channel switching. They hadn't thought of that back then. You just turn it up to it just thoughts and... Does it do any other sounds? No. And that was it. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was... That Beautiful was simplicity got. those days have got. Yeah. I mean, you know... <laughs> Amps can get very, very complicated, and there are yeah. some people that love a, a simple plug a few pedals into a simple head and go, and I, I can kind of understand the, the charm with that. And at one time, that's all you had. There yeah. were no choices. But yeah, Hendrix used it to great effect, these double stops to embellish chords, Little Wing being a prime example. When I learnt Little Wing properly in my teens, I started to realise this. Yeah. You know, I, I always knew bits of Little Wing and could never string it together properly. And then I actually got hold of a proper tab and made it work. And I was like, ah, now I think I'm really getting it. Because everything was based around a chord. So, you know, whether it's the first... There's the C, G... Everything, E minor, G, A minor, back to E minor again, B minor, B flat, A minor, C, G, F, C, and D. Yeah. Everything's based around those chords. Some of them are open, some of them are barred. Yep. But it's it's just little embellishments off of those. suggest the best way to instigate these sorts of double stops in your own playing is maybe when you get together a chord progression like we've been looking at maybe play it around a few times and for as long as you like on each chord exploring the different double stops that we've been looking at you know what ones do you like the sound of yeah yeah what are your favorite ones you know some i find are really good for, for certain things and maybe not so great for others. 
Another one Hendrix used quite a lot, which isn't a double stop, but was definitely an embellishment, is he'd have a chord, like a straight sort of F shape. But like, I'm playing it up here, so it's a C at the 8th fret. So I've got B string, G string, D string, 8, 9, 10. And I'm covering the top string at the 8th as well. And then he would use his little finger, in this case on the 10th fret, so in line with the 3rd finger. So something like, hey Joe. Yeah, yeah. So I know it's a little bit off point because it's not a double stop. Yeah. But you get the idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get the idea. You can also use sort of double stop ideas in open chords. So again, let's take the chords you had. So you had A minor. If we take an open A minor chord. Because you know that it's... it's yeah, it's oh, yeah. Chris Rhea, The Road to Hell. Not now, but it This is... Seven on the end instead of the C. Yeah, 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 yeah. Nice. Thank you, Chris, for your little end. So <laughs> what I did there, I, I had double stops based around the chord shape. So I started with an open A minor, centred my picking, I guess, or on the G and the B strings. Yep. And started off the basic A minor shape. So I did include the D string. Yep. Slid that up two frets. So I'm now B diminished D and D. And then add five and five. And then I went to the D minor. And at the D how'd minor... You, how'd you go there? Oh, right, down to there, yeah. Yeah. So the D minor, again, this time I've moved over to the next two sets of strings, which is the B and the top E. Yep. And we've got the third and the first there from the D minor chord, of course. And then the C. Down two frets. C. And then you've got the six on the B. D minor. Five on nice. top. Sneaky. Sneaky.
super different yeah. ones there. Yeah, it's really good for country in it, the old C. You were using your chicken picking, weren't you, as well? I was. I was using my, my, my cheeky talons. Yeah, so, I like yeah. it. So I'm, I'm using my pick to do the bass note. And I'm rolling sometimes. Right, okay. We hit one note just for the other. Ah, okay. Rolling on the on the right hand. That kind of you. I think you might have missed some of that, but I'll play it through again for yeah, you. Yeah, go on then, yeah. You play me some Guthrie Trap, now I'm playing like Guthrie Trap. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> I strongly recommend everyone out there go and check out Guthrie Trap's Life After Dark album. Fantastic. Check it. While well, we've been listening to Commodity, a great tune. It's an yeah. amazingly fantastic guitar work. Lovely. Lovely. Beautiful player. <laughs> right, here we go. <laughs> all very very sweet indeed sounds really difficult <laughs> it's, it's not all double stops but that only comes from from knowing the neck it's again it's about making that connect yeah once I made the connect between chords and and lead playing I found that was a big step forward to me it's like throwing the barn doors wide open I think the first time I realised it was I thought you know what I've, I've got a bit of speed going on here if only I could have some of my runs end in the right place against the chord that I want them to end against. And I thought, well, I guess the root note of the chord is a good place to start. Yep. So if you're in C, end yep. on a C or whatever. And then I thought, well, that's okay. A bit limiting. And then I thought, well, what's in the chord? Oh, we've got this note, this note, this note. Well, that's three notes we know are more than fair game. Mm. So in a C chord, we could end on the C, I guess. We could end on the E. 
Yeah. We can on the G. And you can end it, you know, with a bend or harmonic or whatever. Or mix it up, because that sounds great, doesn't it? Just the three together. It does. And the other thing, too, is when you start mixing that in with some very rhythmic phrasing, and you also use it for melody... Yeah. You can expand a melody. Because you might start with a melody that maybe ends on the roof. Now it can end on the third. Next time it'll end on the G. And go back to the C. All very melodic. And you've expanded that melody. The thing, the thing about that, I only really, apart from the end, I went up pretty much on one string. Yeah. Just pitch. Get your three notes in the course. G string. Fifth fret is your C. Ninth fret is your E. So I'm on the G string there. Oh, we are. Otherwise, we are, in, we are in Barney. And then 12th fret gives you the G. If I just give you a simple chord vamp, just have a go. You know, you're on, on a roll with it. All you've got to do is tidy up the rhythm a little bit and decide how, how you're going to place it. Yeah. Not bad for just off the top of your head. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know. But it allows you to take uh, one melodic idea and and then kind of stretch it out. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. You know, and keep, Thanks, yeah. keep the audience with you. Yeah, yeah. You can use the same sort of principles even when you're soloing or something like that. Bring those double stops in a bit. Well, the double stops and also the connecting with the chords thing. Double stops, one place that it's it's used, which we've all heard, we all know and love, Van Morrison's Brown Eyed Girl. Now, this is a different kind of form of double stop. This is like the classic double stop. Yes. So... Often double stops are played sort of on maybe the top two strings or on other strings too. Now this is actually a really good learning point. Yeah, you're pretty much there. That's right. It does a bit of a funny one. It kind of changes from the G chord to the C chord and the G major scale to the C major scale. It's a 7 and 5. Yeah, okay, got it. Got a wonderful little story to tell you. A few years ago, we were in the studio and we were practicing this for some wedding or something like that. (laughs) It was one of those just like, Everyone's heard you play this and probably a hundred other guys play this, you know, millions of times. And, you know, it should it should be sort of under your fingers. And I think the song started and I wasn't looking at where I was going. And it's quite spread out if you do it over just the two strings, yeah, which yeah. is the way I've always played it. And I played it with the perfect rhythm. Everything was off. <laughs> you were just one, right. one fret out, out or something. <laughs> <laughs> Turn into comedy guitar piece, yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> I don't think any anyone in the room was left standing after that one. Yeah. Because it feels like it should fit, doesn't it, if it's rhythmically there as well. Yeah, like, you're it's, quite, it's, quite it's like your brain telling you one thing and your ears are going, no, nah, nah, that ain't right. So those kind of double stops, hmm. this is quite a key learning point, actually. If we learn the scales... Not just as pattern scales, but you actually learn the intervals like this. It's really helpful. So if you learn, say, the C major scale, you start down here. First fret of the B string. Yeah. Open top E. 
So yep. this is the C major scale in thirds. Yep. Then three and one. Minor. Five and three. Minor. Six. Major. And five. Eight and seven. Ten and eight. Twelve and ten. Yeah. And you can do that wherever, whatever key you like. F. start to learn the co-relationship from one note to another yeah 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 that's definitely a useful useful tactic because essentially they, these are what these double stops are aren't they Is these are those music? sixths those ones we normally ah so they're they're sort of slightly sixths. rogue-esque because they yeah. have a they sound great don't they those very much a country or blues kind of thing <laughs> yeah they are sixes so the G note there, for example, is played against the E note. So fifth fret against fifth fret. So E is sixth above G. Yeah. <laughs> but you can use them and integrate those with your others. Why not? So you, you know. Thing to try yep. before we run. Um, this was one of the things that Big Jim showed me, and it kind of stuck because I thought well, that's really cool as well. Is if you've got a note, in this case, I'm just picking the G note, fifth fret on the D string. If you play the seventh fret against it of the G, major seven, so no, the sorry, G fifth. string, so you've got the fifth, yeah. Now, obviously, it doesn't work between the G and the B string for obvious reasons because of that pesky B. Yeah. But on the E and A, A and D, D and G, and B and E, this works. So... every note so I was in yeah. the key of G so if you use the G as like your starting point I'm, I'm starting now on the 8th fret of the B string and then I've essentially kind of Going. That kind of thing. Yeah. 
Make a cheek jump at the end there to get some IG. Oh, Something like that. But it's a completely different sound. Do you notice, because you were talking about different styles, where might we implement some yeah. different styles? So, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a bit of rock. That was a, I suppose it was very country, <laughs> but it's got this kind of like, kind of colourful rock vibe to it almost as well, hasn't it? Yeah, well, you could use, you know, if you're if you're looking at the the darker side of things, <laughs> without going metal as such, but you want to kind of more Darth Vader, Darth Vader. <laughs> <laughs> idea really isn't it yeah i mean yeah. basically it's power chords but yeah. you know you, you've got that ability then not to just stick with your normal power chords you can embellish by moving around moving them around yeah. I think I'm lifting off for a fraction of a second. Barely, barely perceptible. interval of a full for a third will have it is instrumental and obviously not yeah. only just getting the right sort of effect out of the chords and double stops that you want but also the tone of the piece I guess you know like uh, yeah you know the kind of thing you're playing over you know if, if you've got a piece that's quite rocky or strident yeah you know you you might want to use fifths for that very reason yeah hence yeah, yeah. power chords littered over every rock song isn't there for the most part if you want things to be really pretty, using thirds is always kind of a... Thirds or sixths or something, yeah. Yeah, a good option. Or, yeah. Or, or you, I guess I guess if you're playing the piano or something, you could add a, a sixth and a third together in there. That's sevenths. Are they, uh... The major sevenths. Yeah. Very jazzy, I suppose. Jazz in it, really, yeah. Mm. Jazz, jazzy sound. I mean, really, those three note sort of chords are what jazzers use all the time, aren't they? Yeah. Although they, yeah. they will use sort of some of the other things for probably jazz soloing and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
West Montgomeryism there with the octaves. Thank you very much for that. That's awesome. Those are great double stops. Cheers. Enjoy. Stay tuned for more episodes, jams, improvisation ideas and well-informed thoughts about amps, pedals and guitar tone. If you enjoy this podcast, leave us a review on iTunes, find us on SoundCloud or see our website on tunein-toneup.com. Here you'll find show notes, tabs and further research and resources. It's also a good place to get in touch. We hope you're finding these lessons as interesting and as useful as I do, and if you have any suggestions, we'd love to hear them. Yeah.